Okay. Now the London force, sometimes called the London dispersion, dispersion. force, go right here, which we we abbreviate LDF, is between two nonpolar molecules. Okay, so if you have two nonpolar molecules, it's an LDF. That's correct. The end. That's right. Okay, that's what easy. causes that though. It's caused by momentary dipoles. Momentary dipoles. Yeah. All right. Here's an example. A, Please a explain. Classic. Classic. Example is oxygen. Oxygen okay. is, this is oxygen, O2. You know, if I draw the Lewis structure, one thing when you're doing these, oh, yeah. is you have to draw Lewis structures. Yeah, when over, you're determining, again. yeah, what to, if you're determining what kind of force it is, you have to always draw the Lewis structure first. Determine its polarity. Determine its polarity. By its shape and its, and its bond, electron activity yep. deal. And then you can determine what type of intermolecular forces you're that dealing with. That is correct. I had to make sure I got the right ter or tra. Yeah. Okay. So here's my oxygen molecule with a bunch of electrons. Mm -hmm. But one thing we've learned about electrons from forever ago now is that electrons are not static. They, they, move, they move, so to speak. They move around. So if they're like this, that's true. But what mm -hmm. happens if this electron for just a moment moved over here and he's no longer here? Then it's and then be... this electron right here moved over here for just a moment. Well, then if the electron moves, it carries its negativeness with it. That's correct. And it moves the area of more or less negativeness with it. So it would make this side of this atom or this molecule negative over right, here. Right, because it moved to the right. And this side-ish positive. Right. Well, if the same thing happened on this side and it was positive and this side was negative. Hey, opposites attract. Opposites attract. And you get well, a very, a, very weak. You're kind of attracting a positive to a positive there. Oh, yeah, they, I did it wrong. So, well, it would be attracted to here. There you go. And they would flip, mm -hmm. actually. Yep. That's called a London dispersion force. Now, you probably know this, but oxygen is not a solid at no. room temperature. It's a gas. It's a gas. <laughs> We're breathing it in right now. So therefore, they're really not attracted at all. But if you cool it down enough, this force is what causes the O2 to connect to the O2. Liquid oxygen. Cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Here's actually the picture that I meant to draw, and basically positives with negatives. You may want to print this out if it just shows you just the momentary movement. I actually moved this electron here, and I moved this electron here, and that's how I did it. I forgot. All right. Now, there is sort of a, another interesting thing. Now, when we think of nonpolar things, we think of things that um, have very, very low melting points because mm -hmm. they have very, very weak bonds. But some things actually have very high melting points, yeah. and that's because instead of being one London dispersion force, there are many. So yeah. here I have. It's like the, the, the fuel that you put in your car. That's a nonpolar compound, or many nonpolar compounds, but it's still liquid. Yeah, so one thing that goes into gasoline is hexane. There's this a lot small amount of hexane in gasoline, I think it is at least, right? I know there's toluene. I don't know. Oh well, but anyways, eh. it, you, you could burn hexane. Well, we'll I pretend. You. And yeah. I know it's a liquid. This yeah. substance is a liquid at room temperature, guys. We played have some in the stock room. So, um, I think. but why does it stick together? Well, it turns out these are all nonpolar, so you'd say it's a London dispersion force. But if you have lots of atoms, there's lots of electrons. Mm -hmm. So you can have lots of London dispersion forces, and if you take them and you add them together they can add up to a relatively strong force. I feel an analogy coming on. Yes, I have an analogy. Have you ever played with thread? You know, like thread, like that you, when you're sewing. Yes. It's very easy to break. You right. snap it. But what if I took, say, 100 pieces of thread and intertwined them together? Into you know, a larger string or rope. A rope. Stronger. And much stronger. You right. see, individually they're weak, but together they can be strong. Mm. So there's even uh, nonpolar things that are solids because they're just bigger right, molecules. Like iodine crystals, iodine, iodine crystals. Yeah. Uh, lots of examples yeah. of these, uh, like wax from a candle. Oh, yeah. That's nonpolar and yeah. that's, you know, it's, it can be melted relatively easy, but it is a solid. Yeah. Okay, so here's something we should say, um, just a summary of that. The larger the, the nonpolar molecule, the higher, higher the boiling point. And why is that? Uh, more electrons equal stronger bonds. More electrons equals more. More LDFs. LDFs. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah. Okay. Now, one more thing that we want to cover is the network solids. Now, in a network solids, this is a substance that does not have inter intermolecular forces. Right. None of them. It's all covalent bonds. 100% covalent bonds. Okay. And these only happen with compounds of carbon and silicon. Now, we need to be careful. It's not any compound with carbon in it. It's yes. a compound of pure carbon. Carbon only. only. And with silicon, it's actually usually silicon, silicon and, some and stuff. oxygen. Usually, usually oxygen. Not that, I think you. Yeah, you can do it with other stuff too. Not many though. Not many, but carbon. It has to be carbon only. It's not like carbon and hydrogen because that's definitely not. Yeah, we'll show you some examples of that. Yeah. In fact, we'll hear um, some examples. So, this is a diamond. 
Okay. A diamond is made up of all carbon. Mm -hmm. Carbon to carbon to carbon. It's in a tetrahedral yeah, arrangement. This is like a piece graphite. of graphite. Graphite is carbon to carbon to carbon in a slightly different arrangement. I'll show you that in a minute. And this is a crystal of quartz. And that's silicon and oxygen. I forget the exact formula. SiO3, okay. I think, isn't it? Two. Uh, is sure. it? Okay, graphite. This is graphite. And you All can right. kind of see this is the uh, bonds. And actually, there are London forces. This is kind of a complex one, but it is yeah. a. These are the hardest substances known to man, these network solids. And you can kind of see um, this is the structure of graphite. Yep. And the, those sheets of graphite that you can see, the layers, they kind of slippery. They slide on top of each other. Because That's why graphite of is the slippery. London forces. But right. between the sheets, they're very, right. very those, strong. Yep, between the, each molecule. Okay, now diamonds are pretty cool. Yeah. I think we should, there's a... Oh, yeah, I think this moves if we click on yeah, the link. Yeah, let me like, click on the link here. So here is the um, crystal right here yeah, of diamond. Yeah, tetrahedral all arrangement. Tetrahedral, remember that uh, bent, or the 109-degree uh, angle, and they go on and on and on and on, and so that's what the diamonds look like. Okay. All right. Now, we uh, had a visit a while back, Mr. Sams, mm -hmm. to uh, the Smithsonian Institution, and we got to see probably the, not probably, certainly the most famous diamond in the world. Yeah. And I think we should take a, a slight tour there. Well, let's do it. Okay. Okay. All right, what you just saw there is the Hope Diamond. It's a classic example of a covalent network solid. All the carbon atoms are arranged in a tetrahedral shape, which makes it one of the hardest substances in the world. The hardest substance, actually, in the world. That's very cool. I mean, the coolest diamond in the whole world. Big. And it's really, really big, and that's just, just, just really cool. Okay, quartz. This is quartz, and we can kind of see his structure. And I think, Mr. Sams, I think you're right, it's SiO2, and that's quartz crystals. And I think the red is the oxygen, and the gray is the silicon, if yep. I'm not mistaken. looks about right. And uh, actually, while we were at the Smithsonian, we also saw a huge piece of quartz. quartz. And Let's so I think we should uh, visit the Smithsonian for just a minute again. Another example of a network solid is quartz. And this piece of quartz is absolutely gargantuan here at the Smithsonian. It, it was found in Nambia, Africa. So this is silicon dioxide, SiO2. Huge piece, isn't it? Again, that was really, really cool. Big. Big. All right. There's a lot of quartz around here, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's quartz. Yeah, yeah, big chunks of it kind of within the granite. Yeah. If you go, uh, those lo quartz lo lines. Local people, if you ever uh, hike up on Wallow Canyon, there's a little outcropping you can climb down to. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, and, and lastly, let's just kind of summarize mm -hmm. this as it all goes together. So we've got bonding. And you always have to, first of all, just determine what type of a compound, metal to metal, non-metal to non-metal, metal to non-metal. Right. And then when it's covalent, you've got some more work to do. Yep. You then got to draw its Lewis structure. So after this, you've got to draw the Lewis structure. Once you do that, well, actually, unless it's just carbon and the silicon, you can just jump over here to network solids. But if, it's, uh, if you draw the Lewis structure, you've got to determine if it's nonpolar. If it's nonpolar, then it's a London force. If it's a polar, then it's a hydrogen bond or, or a dipole force. And you have to determine by this the ET phone home method. Right. If, if, it's, it, it, if it's a phone home molecule, then it's a hydrogen bond. If it's not, it's a dipole. Yeah. Okay. So that's how we do this. And we've got one more podcast. And we'll do some topic. practice with that. And we'll do some practice with this table. Okay. Bye.